Welcome to the Starfleet Leadership Academy, a leadership development podcast told through the lens of Star Trek. And now here's your host, Jeff Aiken. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining me today. In this fun episode of Voyager, we see the difference your mindset can make, especially in a crisis situation. And we learn the absolute power of believing in others. Let's dive into the 14th episode of the fourth season, Message in a Bottle. Voyager's one that we always need to do a little bit of table setting before diving in, but for this one, eh, there's really not that much to get caught up on, really. Seven of Nine is still not fully trusted by a lot of the crew, and Bellana Torres is wearing a lab coat for, I don't know, some reason. Well, actually, I know the reason. See, Roxanne Dawson was pregnant for a lot of this season, and this was, this was how they covered it up, and honestly, I think it worked pretty well. Now, when Seven came on board, she set up camp in the Astrometrics lab. It's a part of the starship that we really haven't seen that much of before, but it just, it makes incredible sense to have this. She's been using her Borg experience to, to augment the charting, scanning, communication, stuff like that, all in that lab since coming on board. Better, stronger, faster. And that's where we pick things up. Walking down a corridor, Torres is complaining to Chicote about Seven. Cold, patronizing, arrogant. Chicote tells her to talk to Seven and just work it out. He actually has a really, really cool response. What do you want me to do? Throw her in the brig for the rest of the trip home? And then he just tells her to find a way to deal with her. Now on the surface, and in my explanation, this sounds like Chicote is just just blowing her off. But we got to remember, we've caught this, we've caught this midstream. There's a long-standing issue between Torres and Seven ever since she came on board. And really, that, well, that's not fair, right? Shouldn't be that way. But the issue, the issue is Torres. Seven doesn't really have a problem with her specifically. She she treats everybody like this. But really, who hasn't run into this problem like at work before in in any capacity? You and someone else are having an issue or or people, people bringing their conflicts to you to deal with. So Chakotay technically is right. You know, the best thing to do in a situation like this is to address the person directly. You don't accuse them. You're not telling them that they're doing something wrong. You know, in fact, if you come at them like that, you're, you're just going to escalate the problem. The right thing to do here is for Chicote to coach Bolana on how to talk with Seven about this. He should encourage empathy and listening as well as communicating how Seven's actions and her language affect her, but in a, but in a, I don't know, like a positive, non-accusatory manner. And if he was really on his game, he'd role play with her. I know, I know, I can hear you now. But Jeff, I hate role playing with my teams. Oh, it's so embarrassing. They hate it too. It just feels so childish. Well, yeah, it can feel like that. But, but do you know the one surefire way to get better at anything? Practice. So Chicote plays the role of seven. And they practice. Bellana tells him, as her, how her behavior is affecting her. They back and forth until she's more comfortable with how to approach it. And then Chicote sends her on her way to talk with Seven. And because he's hitting on all cylinders right now in our, in our little imaginary scenario, he asks her to come back afterwards and talk about how it went. But that that doesn't happen here. And, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because I think that something like this must have already happened, but Bolana Bolana's still just complaining. And let's talk about complaining, right? Because, oh, man, it feels good sometimes, right? Like complaining can be great. And honestly, a lot of good can come from it if you follow one tiny little piece of advice from me. That is, you get to complain once, and after that, you either do something about it or you live with it. And here's another thought. In our last episode, Elementary Dear Data, we talked about neurodivergence and how that caused data to understand the rules of the game 
differently than Jordy did. The same could apply here as well. Neurodivergence at its simplest refers to having a brain that works differently than a typical brain. Now, hear me say this though, that is not a bad thing. It is just the way a person's brain works. I'm going to save my examination of seven for a future episode that's a little more focused on her. So here, I'm going to focus just on her behavior. She is being bluntly honest. She's saying exactly what is on her mind and isn't pausing for like the the, the niceties of personal interaction. Belana, maybe understandably, takes offense at this, but she's she's only thinking of herself of her own point of view, her own perspective. Imagine, if you will, that Seven is neurodivergent. Imagine that her brain just works differently. That shouldn't be too hard to imagine, really, right? Well, in her mind, she's being perfectly appropriate. There's a job to do, and she is doing it. When communication is a part of that job or task, she communicates only what is strictly necessary. So if Bellana follows the advice my version of Chakotay gave her, actively listening with empathy, she would see their interactions from Seven's point of view and, and maybe realize that in her own way, Seven is trying to connect with her. But even if she's not, because that's a huge assumption that I'm making, even if she's not, she's, she's focused on the task at hand and nothing else. And really, that's okay. Okay, back to the episode. Chakotay meets up with Janeway on his way to Astrometrics. Seven has found and tapped into a massive network that stretches across the Delta Quadrant and close into the Alpha. She's even located a Federation starship in the Alpha Quadrant that's just barely in range of the network. Can you hear me now? After a lot of nerd speak about range and bandwidth and signal strength, they, they determine that a comm signal just, just isn't strong enough to traverse the network. So they decide to send a holographic message. Specifically, they decide to send the doctor. Now, this is a moment where I have to remind myself, this is a TV show, and they make decisions about how long they spend on different things based on making a watchable TV show, not on demonstrating strong leadership. But still, there is a strong chance that this is this is a suicide mission for the doctor. Like, there's a, a really good chance that this is just a one-way trip. Janeway tells him this. He spends, I don't know, maybe three seconds considering it and then agrees really wish they would have let Janeway do or, I don't know, say something to inspire him to make that decision. With any luck, they'll be able to send you back the same way you came. Luck. But I mean, I guess they have all of about 40 seconds to make the call. So he's good being the hero. And he's away. Good luck, Doctor. There's that word again. Fingers crossed. Everyone's worried. And the transmission is successful. And he ends up in the sick bay of the USS Prometheus. But some rough timing. There's no Starfleet crew on the ship. They've all been killed. Romulans boarded, and they've taken over the ship. Right off the bat, the atmosphere, the lighting here is great. It looks like business as usual, but there's just... There's just bodies strewn on the floor, just 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 kind of haphazardly. And and honestly, in the makeup of this, I love, I love that the Prometheus crew is wearing the new, you know, DS9 first contact style uniforms. It gives you, it really makes the feeling of separation between Voyager and the rest of Starfleet palpable. We meet the Romulans on the bridge, and their commander, Ricard, hmm, looks looks really familiar. I just huh, yeah, I don't know. Can't quite place them. Dan, follow them into the nebula, sir. Our shields would be useless. Well, they're intercepted by a Federation ship. Then they show the Prometheus's secret that makes it a prototype ship. It has a multi-vector assault mode. That means it can it can split into three sections and then attack as three independent units. It's pretty cool. They attack the ship, and in the battle, one of the Romulans is injured. Ricard orders him to sickbay. Oh, okay, 
That's who he is. Duh, of course. Now I recognize him. He's James, Diana's henchman from V. <laughs> Duh. And of course, I know he's also Joaquin or Joachim or whatever from Star Trek too. He was he was Khan's right hand man. God, he was awesome in that role. Just just as he was as James, right? In V. Any V fans out there? I'd love to hear from you. That that led to an appearance for him in TNG's Symbiosis and also here. So he ended up a, a real Star Trek mainstay. So the injured Romulan comes into sick bay and the doctor plays the EMH role. Please state the nature of the medical emergency. Who activated you? You did. Automatically when you entered sick bay. He's accompanied by another officer who leaves him there and takes off. So once she's gone, the doctor activates the ship's actual emergency medical hologram and is surprised to not see himself. You see, this is the EMH Mark II. Now, back in the Deep Space Nine episode from the fifth season, Dr. Bashir, I presume, which aired oh, about a year before this one, Bashir was up to be the model for the Mark II. Now, some stuff happened in that episode, and well, long story short, he was disqualified. And apparently, their number two choice was Andy Dick, because uh, apparently he wasn't doing anything else. Now, he and the doctor really do not hit it off on the right foot at all. Yes, yes, yes. You're the Mark One EMH, the inferior program. The doctor explains the situation, and the Mark II starts following protocols as programmed. And really, he's he's starting to panic. Starfleet Security Protocol 28, subsection D. In the event of hostile alien takeover, the EMH is to deactivate and wait for rescue. But the doctor is on it. He asks for a situation update and says it's up to the two of them to take the Prometheus back. But the Mark II, he just can't handle it. Again, the doctor is the picture of confidence and authority. He completely takes charge of the situation. I'm a doctor, not a commando. It's time you became a little of both. Back on Voyager, the crew, including Janeway, are getting hopeful. They're composing letters to friends and family back home, you know, just in case. And in a cool scene, wow, I can't believe I'm saying this. In a cool scene, Neelix is freaking out. He's trying to cook some new, you know, more, more Earth-friendly food. This stuff's made in New York City. New York City. Get a rope. He wants to be sure he has marketable job skills when Voyager gets home. But, <laughs> yeah, he still has a ways to go. It's just a matter of perfecting the recipe. Each time I'll use a few less jalapenos. As the doctor continues to try to convince the Mark II they need to do something, he references one of my favorite books. Turn this ship around. I call this masterpiece by L. David Marquis required reading for anyone that sees themselves as a leader. And lucky for you, you can find a copy on my reading list at jeffaken.com. Well, following the tenets of intent-based leadership, he comes up with a plan to gas the Romulans and sends the Mark II into the Jeffries tube to set it up. Problem is, though, the controls for the ventilation systems are on the bridge. So the doctor heads up there. On the bridge, he updates the Romulans on the patient from earlier and says he needs to scan them for a virus. He uses the opportunity to try and initiate the ventilation. While he's doing this, though, Ricard says he's made arrangements to hand the ship off to the tall Shi'ar. And right after that, he catches the doctor in his ruse. Frustrated, serving as the doctor on Voyager, Tom Paris convinces Kim to try and develop his own EMH. Yeah, pretty sure nothing, nothing's going to go wrong there. Going to go really smooth. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. And while those shenanigans are going on, Balana is in astrometrics and confronts Seven. State your reasons for making these modifications. State your reasons, please. It's not what you say, Seven, it's how you say it. I don't understand. As they start to argue, a signal comes over the relay. There's an aggressive armored alien called a Herogen, saying that the network belongs to them and kicks Voyager off of it. They've lost their connection to the Doctor. And oof, the Doctor could really use that connection right now. Rakar is interrogating him, trying to figure out who he's working with and where those people are. 
Rakar and his aide believe that he is a sabotage agent sent from Starfleet. And just as they're about to extract his subroutines, which sounds very painful, the gas hits and they pass out. <laughs> the Mark II did it. EMH Mark II had to improvise. Inspiration. He accessed the main computer and simulated a shipwide biohazard, making the computer think there was a microbiotic contamination on all decks. They head to the bridge. They get on the helm and try to figure out how to fly the ship. As they're figuring it out, they read three Romulan warbirds are on a course to intercept with them. On Voyager, Seven and Torres reconnect to the network. Janeway attempts to negotiate with the Herogen, but, but he just shuts her down and tries to jam the link. Suddenly, though, he's shocked and he falls incapacitated. I generated a feedback surge along our sensor link. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. Seven confirms the network link is stable and Janeway asks to be updated if the Herogen reach out again. Kim gives his emergency medical replacement hologram a shot. It looks great, but, uh, but that's about it can't handle the data transfer. He decides that it's just, it's just not going to work. So Kim goes to plan B and sends a copy of Gray's Anatomy to, to Tom Paris. I'm downloading Gray's Anatomy chapter by chapter. I thought you said it was too much data for his holomatrix to handle. It's not for the EMH. It's for you. Back on the Prometheus, the Romulans approach. The Mark II and the Doctor are starting to work together. I said shields! Already done! Shields up! They try to fool the Romulans, but shockingly, totally miss the mark. The Romulans start firing on the Prometheus, and then the cavalry arrives. Three Starfleet vessels enter the fray. They're saved! Oh, or not. They start firing on the Prometheus, thinking it's been hijacked by Romulans. Frantic, they're trying to figure out tactical now as well, so they can defend themselves. Mark II leans on a console, and that kicks off the multi-vector assault mode. Did I do that? The ship splits apart, destroys one of the warbirds, and the other two Romulan ships retreat. Two holograms alone. Romulans on one side, Starfleet on the other. Alarms beeping everywhere. EMH Mark II, newborn but filled with courage. EMH Mark I, armed with years of experience. Together they emerged triumphant. The end. Starfleet officers beam over and take the EMHs into protective custody. Shortly after, the doctor returns. He proudly tells his story to Janeway, Chakotay, and Tuvok. And not only did he accomplish his mission, but he I spoke directly with headquarters. They're going to contact the crew's families, and they're going to begin working hard to bring them home. And they sent a message that just floors Janeway. You're no longer alone. Star Trek is really good at a lot of things, and comedy is not always one of them. But this episode really hit on the right tone to tell a solid story with some good laughs. Come to Quark's Quark's is fun. Come right now. Go Quark. Run! Hi there, cadets. In our last episode, where we watched Discovery's Choose Your Pain, we talked about the incredible performance review that Saru set up for himself. Well... I created a tool to help you do the same thing for yourself. For your free copy of this tool, visit jeffaken.com and join our mailing list. You'll get access to a copy that you can download for yourself and for your team. Just visit jeffaken.com and join the mailing list. Thanks. Have you lost your job? Have you lost a loved one? Are you exhausted caring for your parents, for your kids? Well, you can find immediate relief when you read Sheila Mack's new number one bestseller, Bootstraps and Bra Straps. It contains the boots formula to move from rock bottom back into action in any situation, especially right now. The life has knocked you down. Pick yourself up with Bootstraps and Bra Straps. Get your copy at www.SheilaMack.com today. I kind of made fun of them casting Andy Dick, but the reality is he very much wanted to be on Star Trek. And I think he and Robert Picardo matched up really well in this. They had really fun back and forths, many of which we'll talk about in the command codes. And they played off of each other really, really well. And much like we talked about in the 13th episode of the Starfleet Leadership Academy Homestead, 
This episode shows the payoff of the development of people on Voyager. In that episode, it was Neelix, and here, it's the Doctor. He really shines as a leader and a risk taker here, and, and that is not at all what we saw of him back in Caretaker. Voyager has a lot of enemies as it travels through the Delta Quadrant, right? There's the Kazon, the Borg, the Vidians, and so many more. This episode introduces one of my favorites, the Herosian. They are serious business and will be an ongoing concern for a while, and that kicks off right after this episode. But but seriously, like, how is, how is everybody okay with Seven just knocking that guy out? I mean... <laughs> Alana was all about it. Mild shock. Not bad. Thank you. Now, the Harry Kim and Tom Paris emergency medical replacement hologram thing was, was kind of, well, it was, yeah, it was, it was dumb. I mean, Tom's just manipulating Harry Kim to get his way. And, and, and what, Kim, Kim's a holographic expert now? Like, for an ensign, this guy sure seems to be the expert at a lot of things. They could have just dropped this complete nonsense and added a little more to the scene where Janeway was telling the doctor about his mission, you think? Command codes verified. In a prior episode, Elementary Dear Data, Dr. Pulaski taught us so much, and now the doctor gets to do the same. We're going to compare his mindset to that of the Mark II and talk about what that means to, to you. And then we're going to look at how he helped the Mark II become more than he ever thought he could possibly be. The Starfleet Leadership Academy is supported by listeners just like you. Click the link in the show notes to support the ongoing production of this podcast. What is your mindset? Have you been asked this before? Have you even thought about it before? A mindset is how you see and interpret the world around you. It's the basis of assumptions you make about situations, people, and, and, and anything else. It defines what you expect to happen in any given situation. I like to keep things really simple. It's one of the reasons I love the band KISS. But I, and, and that wasn't a slam on their music. I did the acronym, right? Keep it super simple. Yeah? Okay, cool. Because I love their music. Now, I think of mindsets as an either or. Now, they absolutely are not really just that binary and simple, but, but this helps me to visualize and understand them. I, I hope this does the same for you. So as a really simple example, you can either have a scarcity mindset, uh, th th there's only so much ice cream in the freezer, or you can have an abundance mindset. Isn't it great? I can just go get some more ice cream from the store. So you can probably imagine a group of friends eating ice cream and the different thoughts running through their heads as they enjoy it and how those thoughts, which are the product of their mindset, could influence their actions. The friend with a scarcity mindset may try to hoard the ice cream. I want some ice cream. No, Peter, you finish your food. You, hey, you, you get back here right now, mister. Don't, don't you... Get down from that chair or you're in big trouble. Eating as much as they possibly can, while the friend with the abundance mindset can luxuriate in the divine embrace of salted peanut butter and chocolate chips. Let's look at this same mindset dichotomy in a work-related scenario. Sales. How many of you work in sales? Well, if you have a job and are paid to do it, I'd argue you're in sales whether you think you are or not. And really, we're all selling something. You know, as engineers, you're selling your designs. As project managers, you're selling your schedules and your resource asks. As leaders, as leaders, we sell ideas. That aside, though, if you work in sales, you have likely come across a situation where a customer has needs beyond what you are selling. In the best of situations, they need something else your organization offers so you can smoothly cross-sell them everything they need and everybody's happy. But what if that's not the case? What if what they need is offered by maybe, I don't know, an entirely different vertical or, or even worse, just by a competitor? But the question here is, are you here to make a quick sale and move on? Or 
or do you actually want to help this customer solve their problems? A salesperson with a scarcity mindset would sell what they could and leave the customer needing more. Maybe, maybe if they had the leverage in the meantime, they'd go acquire that other thing so they could sell it too. This person is concerned only with getting the biggest piece of pie they possibly can. But someone with an abundance mindset would just help the customer out. Hey, I'm sorry we could only handle X and Y for you, but but I want to connect you with this company over here that can, that can take care of Z. This person, the person with the abundance mindset, understands that the pie can get bigger and bigger and everyone can have a piece. In fact, if, if everyone works together, they can grow the pie and all have a small piece that ultimately is bigger than the piece they would have gotten had they just made the sale and ran. That's just one example of a mindset. Honestly, there are countless others. And I just want to share, I want to share just three more with you. So we just talked abundance versus scarcity, but there's also intentional versus victim, authentic versus image, and unity versus detached. These are exactly what they sound like. Are you intentional in what you do? And do you believe that you have control or at least agency in what happens to you? Or, or do you believe it stuff just happens? It's like, it's like Tommy Lasorda said, he said, there are three types of baseball players, those who make it happen, those who watch it happen, and those who wonder what just happened. And that's based on Nicholas Murray Butler's original quote. But here, a person with an intentional mindset makes things happen, while a victim mindset wonders what just happened and believes there's nothing they did and nothing they can do to possibly change it. An authentic mindset is focused on truth, transparency, and integrity, while an image mindset worries about how something might make them look. And a person with a unity mindset sees themselves and others and understands life's connections, while a person with a detached mindset is worried only about themselves and focuses on the divisions between people. I like to focus on just these four because, well, you know, it makes it simple. <laughs> you can easily add your own variations and complexity to this model as long as you keep in mind one very very important, critical, critical thing. These mindsets are a choice. Whether you're consciously making the choice or you've just made it so much it's subconscious now, you decide what your mindset is. Now, in our time on the Prometheus, we see mindsets in action. The doctor is coming from a place of abundance, of intention, authenticity, and unity, while the Mark II starts off doubting himself. He's coming from a place of scarcity, and he's very much being a victim. The bridge is swarming with Romulans. That's the first thing you learn in the real world. Think on your feet. Well, good luck then. Computer, deactivate. Not so fast. The doctor, though, is amazing here. He's sharing stories of taking on the Borg, of piloting shuttlecraft, even if it was just in a holodeck, and even telling stories of his, well, um physical and intimate relationships that he's had. His mindset is what steers the EMHs to solve the problem. Without his influence, the Mark II would have just deactivated and waited the whole thing out. He would have ended up wondering what just happened. As the episode continues, though, he begins choosing to wear a different mindset. He changes his thinking. Well, talk about what encouraged that here in a minute, but, but he chose to change. It wasn't easy, but he did it. And after that, they made it happen. The two takeaways on this one are that your mindset determines your thoughts, which then determines your actions. And your mindset is a choice. Be aware of your mindset and intentionally choose to come from a place of abundance, a place of intention, authenticity, and a place of unity. <laughs> if the Mark II can do it, so can you. But what was it that encouraged the Mark II to change his mindsets, his, 
his thinking, and his actions. The doctor did. And he encouraged it. You ready? He encouraged it by believing the Mark II could be more than he thought he could be. If you're a manager or a coach or a teacher or a trainer or a mentor or or even just someone that other people look up to, you must understand how powerful this is. The doctor shifted the Mark II's mindsets in a relatively short amount of time just by completely believing in him. The Mark II immediately tried to slip out of doing anything to help. He assumed he couldn't do any of the things the doctor was talking about. (laughs) Two EMHs retaking the ship? (laughs) No way. Based on his programming, and, and this is a big thing too, right? Based on his programming though, he... He was right. At this point, he has no reason whatsoever to believe that he's capable of doing any of these things. But the doctor, oh, the doctor never doubts him. Not not even for a second. He's He's not trying to convince him to retake the ship. He's just going into the plans to do it. That belief allowed the Mark II to exceed his programming and do more than he ever thought possible. And, even more points for the doctor, he knew this was a stretch for Mark II, but he only acknowledged that in a positive way. Transferring auxiliary power now. Good work, Mark II. He focused on the wins and the positives instead of trying to convince him of his plan or or berating him for, for, for not doing something. Now, imagine what this looks like in your workplace. Imagine what it looks like in your family. Imagine that your supervisor completely, unquestioningly believes in you. Imagine your partner, spouse fully believes in you. Now, you're invincible. That belief gives you the literal superpower to achieve anything. And you do that by intentionally choosing your mindset every day, every interaction, every email, every time. Now take it one step further. Imagine your team. Imagine them after you believe in them. Believe in them without doubt and without question. If your supervisor believing in you gave you superpowers, (laughs) <laughs> Imagine what it will do for your team. This, this is the real deal. Choosing your mindset and creating environments where your teams and the people around you are intentionally choosing them. Oh, this is where the magic happens. Guess what? I want to hear your thoughts on mindsets. Oh, and even more than that, I want to hear about the impacts belief has on you, your teams, and even your family. You can reach out to me on Twitter at SFLA Podcast or anywhere across social media at Jeff T. Aiken. That's Jeff T. as in transmission, A-K-I-N. And come share your thoughts in the Starfleet Leadership Academy podcast group on Facebook. The link is in the show notes. Computer. What are we going to watch next time? Working. The 14th episode of the fourth season of Deep Space Nine, Return to Grace. Hey, that's the same as this episode. Season four, episode 14. (laughs) We're taking a mini trip through the halfway point of fourth seasons. This, ooh, this is a great episode that adds so much complexity to Kira and Ducat's relationship. I so appreciate everything you all do to support the Starfleet Leadership Academy. I'd like to ask you to leave a review wherever you're listening. Leave a review, take a screenshot, and share it with me, and I'll give you a shout out on a future episode. And until then, Ex Astra Scientia. Yeah.